there's the acoustic consultant and the lighting consultant and the traffic consultant. And, you know, the architect ends up having to like, you know, conduct this symphony of specialists um, and well, you know, well putting together, you know, prefabricated windows and bricks and all sorts of products to make the building and the hand of the artist and the control of the artist um, is, is something that's kind of difficult to hold on to in that kind of circumstance. Welcome to architecture, design and photography. And I'm adding an asterisk, uh, uh, little bit of philosophy. It seems like I always push these things that way. So we might have to change the name to ADPP, but regardless, Paul Raff, thank you for joining us on architecture, design and photography. I'll give a little background here that I've pulled from the internets and uh, some of your staff, I believe, and I'll read this off. And if anything's changed or you would like to deny any of it, just let us know. All right. Um, Paul Raff, artist and principal architect behind Paul Raff Studio, a creative design and architectural firm based in Toronto that works both locally and internationally. Paul began his career as a practicing artist. So while he now works predominantly as an architect, his practice and approach are rooted in the artistry that first drew him to both professions. He is also deeply invested in sustainability and his firm has been devoted to this form or to this from the outset. However, he's also deeply concerned with light and flow in his buildings, not as an afterthought to sustainability, but as an aesthetic philosophy that is deeply ingrained in his commitment to environmental responsibility. Paul is perhaps atypical in the variety and scope of the projects he works on from garden pavilions to private homes to transit hubs and master plan communities and resorts. But the thread that winds its way through his work is always the idea that beauty, artistry, and sustainability all rise in tandem through a process that is much about the circumstances, is as much about the circumstances of a building's users as it is about the landscape, nature, and cultural a cultural society, whatever, and in which the building is to be erected. Man, I did so good right until the end there. It was um, excellent. <laughs> Paul Raff, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? Thank you, Trent. I'm doing well. Thanks very much for that nice, kind intro. I like the. Uh, <clears throat> I like what I can see in the background there. The uh, the model. I uh, I spent quite a bit of time in architecture school doing a lot of stuff like that, and I always love to see like section models and site models and stuff so yeah the physical model is a wonderful thing that we learned how to use as a tool in architecture school of course it's being displaced a lot by uh, uh, digital models recently but um, they still have a place and as you know sometimes digital and and physical come together so with uh, uh, 3d printing we can kind of make the two worlds marry quite nicely and uh, there's nothing like seeing a model to really get a feel for space and proportion and a lot of characteristics about a building that does not yet exist. Right. Yeah, I find that the 3D modeling can be a little dangerous unless you make it everything in the model is like yellow or orange or gray or something because the client will eventually go, is, is the whole building going to be gray? Or, you know, they'll, they'll assume too many things because it looks too realistic. But if you're going white foam core, or brown board or whatever, it's, it's a lot more uh, the, the viewer who's not educated uh, gets it a little more, I think. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. I'd also say the 3D model, like the digital model, tends to be most useful for the person who's actually making it. Their head mm -hmm. is in it. And sometimes how the rest of us see it through some sort of screen um, is a little bit distorted because we see so many things, you know, movies right. and TV shows and stuff with screens these days and the cropping and what happens isn't always realistic. And it doesn't always take into account... Um, you know, the, the real nature of, of space and how our optics and our moving heads experience it. Um, more and more, you know, like other firms, we're getting into VR to try and, mm. you know, add to that experience. Um, uh, really, there's nothing like reality. And yep. uh, the more ways you can try to effectively, you know, if you can use multiple media, physical models, VR, conventional plans and elevations and so on, the more you can assemble an idea and, and ways of analyzing the building that doesn't yet exist for, for the own, owner, you know, the user, whatever, whoever is interested to know. Right. I've had some clients actually ask us about doing some of the, uh, it's more like a resort or real estate kind of thing where you, you virtually map the the building from inside so it's kind of like a google streets view but you can go through the building yeah 
And I found that for the design community, I believe that's a little too, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, it's kind of like a, a bad naked. It's, um, if you've seen the Seinfeld episode, <laughs> Uh, he, to demonstrate bad naked, I think he ends up trying to like use a chainsaw while Nate, like as, yeah, yeah. you know, to try and get his girlfriend to understand it. And he's like, it's, it's too much. You, you don't yeah. want to see someone squeezing and clenching to open a pickle jar, you know, while naked. It's, it, uh, in, in real estate photography and representation of a, of a real estate project, you yeah. want to see everything and how everything relates. And it's a lot of information. Yeah. And I find that that kind of VR representation, it's so much to take in, it's so much to process rather than the um, collated, choreographed kind of approach of, of a discrete architectural photography or architectural videography. And yeah. I've, I've found that most clients have considered it and then backed away from it. We've never actually done it for clients yet. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, as far as like after the project's done kind of yeah. thing. So. Yeah, 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 understood. But uh, all that technical fun stuff aside, I like to start off uh, as a true introvert and just go right into uh, what do you believe the underlying foundation of our reality is and what is our purpose to kick things off? Wow. Yes. Wow. It gives, gives me a good starting point for, for somewhere to, to see the, the, the underlying decision process that you use in your creative, creative endeavors. Um. Uh, you know, I just think that, um, you know, you've, you've got, uh, you've got, you've got some time to live and you've got some context to live it in and you've got, you know, other peoples and beings and dynamic things in the world. And, uh, um, it's just all about what you make of, of that, that situation. And, uh, um, which is, you know, frankly, you know, what interested me in, in architecture is, you know, we, we live our lives mostly in buildings and, and, you know, I'm very interested in the physical world around me. If I could spend all my time just walking and around various cities and landscapes on planet earth for the rest of my life, I would. Um, and, uh, but in the meantime, you know, my way of, uh, of, you know, exploring life has a lot to do with, uh, um, perception and, and just being in our environment. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and so, you know, whether it's the snowstorm outside or the, the beach beyond, I, I'm just always interested in what can we do to, you know, most, you know, appreciate, you know, what we have in, in this moment. And, um, um, you know, the design of the built environments, a, a really big part of that. Hmm. Yeah. I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to boil this down and figure it out because I, I'm very interested by the creative process. What makes people creative? What makes people artists, what makes people scientists, what makes people that, you know, kind of thing in between where there's a commercial artist solving a problem that kind of in some way acts like a scientist, like an architect is kind of a, in many ways, a halfway between those two, because you're using building sciences and, and a lot of even like psychology and even some philosophy to really pull together an, an artistic endeavor that, that takes care of some problems. Yeah. And uh, the, the ideas behind or the process behind how people create and, and why some people can create in some areas and then other people can't create in that area. But even though they might seem very conservative, very conscientious and not very open, they'll still have these areas where they are kind of creative. And in that area, they really uh, can can shine. I, I look at the, the differences between my wife and I. She's very conscientious uh, in general and and not you wouldn't you know you wouldn't uh pigeonhole her as a uh creative person in general but she's very creative in writing okay and it, and it is interesting the people i've interacted with that are creative in writing don't generally this is a generalization but don't generally have as much of an aesthetic creativity present in their living space uh there, there's usually other people that are handling that part of their life and their creativity is more like in the storyline in the head, if you will. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a very interesting thing to see. Yeah. Um, but then I see myself, who people will turn me like, "Oh, you're so creative," because it's a lot of visual things that I work with, and that's the first thing that we kind of perceive in many ways. Um, but then when it comes to uh, 
human relations, as far as contractual relations, I, I go extremely conscious, conscientious, extremely conservative. When I'm interacting with people to uh, build something with me, like a house or whatever, I very much so am not entering that into an open disposition as more of a highly contractual disposition. So I'm relying on what's already been established. So I'm, I'm very conservative in that realm because I'm, I'm not a very socially intelligent person on, on a, on a kind of like a mixer, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, inter- extroverted kind of way. I don't, I don't thrive in that. So I have to fall back on the non-creative, what's been established, go with that. Like i if, if you could, if you could show my take on social relations, I'd just go classical architecture all the way. And it's funny because I'll, I've, in school and everything else, I've run into professors that were very like classical is the only way to go, or um, you know, arts and crafts is the only way to go, and and I, it's interesting why people end up where they do. And so to be able to interact with someone like yourself, who it sounds like you took up art first and then went into architecture, I'd be interested to understand why you went art and why you added architecture to this. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I've, I've always been interested in, you know, the, the kind of qualities of an environment, the kind of mood and atmosphere, what, you know, what makes one place seem so different from another how, and the kind of effect it has on us. And, you know, there are a lot of ways to study that. You can study it through photography. You can study it through writing. Um, but, uh, you know, architecture seemed like um, an obvious way because you're, you're, you're actually shaping, you know, helping shape those, but those environments. But it's such yeah. a difficult profession. <laughs> It is. It, a lot of things conspire against um, um, being philosophical and being really creative in architecture. So things such as budget constraints, things such as, you know, um, all the regulations for like building codes and zoning codes. You can't make it this tall. You can't make it this close to the, you know, to the edge. You can't. There's so many mm. things you can't do. Then there are liability issues. Like who wants to innovate? if you're just guinea pigging something and you're the one who's going to get sued like really who wants who wants to innovate so i mean all the horror stories from architecture school of you know suspended bridges and nut tie rods and yeah 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 so actually i you know i in my um, studies of art and architecture i found that somewhere in and around the you know mid late 20th century um the worlds of art and architecture um diverged more than normal and um um you know the world of art went into a uh a, a, a real time of, you know, experiment, experimentation with landscape art and installation art and performance art and conceptual art and all these incredible forms of art outside the gallery and, um, and architecture, uh, by contrast, um, you know, notwithstanding lots of excellent work by a lot of hardworking, talented architects, in some ways went into a period of, of entrenchment and where people are, you know, just you know, defining their contracts and and fighting for their, you know, scope and fees and trying not to get sued and hoping nothing goes wrong and meeting difficult deadlines and, and just, you know, under a tremendous amount of pressure and going along with that, um, uh, increasing forms of specialization. So it used to be that architects used to be involved in all aspects of the building, but now there's not only a structural engineer making sure the building stands up, and a mechanical engineer making sure that the plumbing and, drain, plumbing and drainage and air systems work. There's the acoustic consultant and the lighting consultant and the traffic consultant. And, you know, the architect ends up having to, like, you know, conduct this symphony of specialists um, and, well, you know, well, putting together, you know, prefabricated windows and bricks and all sorts of products to make the building. And the hand of the artist and the control of the artist um, is is something that's kind of difficult to hold on to in that kind of circumstance mm. um but uh but you know nonetheless um the challenge is there if in, in, and and uh i i haven't given up on architecture as as you said in your introduction i i have a practice i went back into practice after uh, quite a number of years of practicing strictly as an artist um and you know i just recognize that it, it requires um um a lot more um uh sort of um, technical skill, uh, business acumen, and mostly excellent uh, communication and collaboration skills to, to try to really work effectively mm. and innovatively in the field of architecture in this day and age. Yeah, it, yeah. from what you're saying, uh, it, it seems to me, when I look at um, older, like drawings for buildings from 100 years ago, yeah. 
it's like they out they were mostly outlining how the general structure would uh, lay out and yeah. the uh, trim interior and exterior. Like they set the artistic vision and the 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 uh, floor plans and everything else, but it didn't seem to be as nitpicky detailed about everything. Like it, there was more of a the architect as artist and then a dependence on the builder to be highly, uh, highly competent in what they were doing. So yeah, there's the, like an the artistic skills, direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, they, the skills and the craftsmanship. There was a kind of more of a reliance on craftsmanship. And I mean, craftsmanship is, uh, you know, um, not what it used to be. And instead, oh. it's more about products coming together. The Some of the craftsmen we have in Maine, though, I have to say, of anywhere mm. I've been in the world, uh, some of the fine home builders in Maine are just so... This sounds like a bad thing to say, but they take, they're take they so prideful. <laughs> they take so much pride and take it so seriously when you run into the, the good people. It's just yeah. amazing to, to see. And then to see, you know, the, the shooting I've done out west, it's a different thing of, um, it's, it's more like grandiose forms that are kind of drive it sprayed and, you know, there, there's an expression of things and there's an openness and an ability that's created for large open spaces from technical things, but the, the, the hand of the builder in it is far less seen. It's these general processes that are large scale and applicable by unskilled labor you know, to a degree um, yeah. that, that seems to have been lost over time. But to get back to, to, to your uh, choice of, of uh, actually bringing architecture into what you're doing and not only being an artist. When you were an artist, were you expressing singularly uh, your vision or your experience turned into what kind of art form? And, and why did you desire to include such a difficult profession as architecture into your daily life? Because from my experience of practicing for three years and interacting with people who uh, established successful firms, it is extremely difficult. Yeah, well, um, when I practiced uh, strictly exclusively as an artist, um, you know, I was working on a pretty large scale. I was doing things like, you know, cutting up abandoned buildings and casting large floors of, of you know, colored concrete and, uh, you know, you know, Doing doing interactive video linked to parts of buildings. Um, oh wow! So it was really it was really um, fairly large in scale, and and really about things that you'd be exploring in architecture about you know the qualities of space and memory and how things change over time and perception and so on. So you know I I was an artist and I was practicing as an artist, and um, one of the great benefits of practicing as an artist is you don't worry about clients as much and you, you don't worry it's not their money you're spending you can kind of make the work and either be a poor artist or maybe sell it or get a commission or a grant or whatever right. you do uh, but there there was a kind of liberation that allowed the work to be about architecture but to be really experimental huh. and um, um, what I found was um, because it was such big scale I still needed to work with teams of people um, I still needed like sometimes a structural engineer or an electrical engineer and um, I still managed like kind of large budgets and uh, and in the end a lot of those things are what you kind of have to do as an architect anyway and um, um, you know what I really I decided to continue you know back with um, making art but also architecture um, uh, because I wanted to be a part of it and I wanted to test the ideas on um, on, uh, on you know on things that that were built to um, um, to have a long life and to and to be lived in. Um, uh, now artworks have a long life and they can Sorry, sort of be lived into, but, uh, right. um, it was just an interest of mine. It was something I wanted to do. So, I mean, what you're describing sounds, uh, just completely beyond the capabilities of the, of the average person to be able to do something at that scale. How were you able to get access to buildings, chop them up and how did you get there? Well, you know, just, um, you know, I had the naivete of youth and, and a lot of tenacity and, um, you know, I, I just took it on and, and uh, um, collaborated with friends and, and worked very hard and probably took risks that I wouldn't take now. Um, uh, you know, when, when, I, when 2,000 people came to see a show where my um, 
my friend and collaborator Dave Warren and I had like half cat sized a house into the ground and you could walk through it. A lawyer friend of mine said to me, you're inviting the general public into the condemned site of a half demolished building. This doesn't sound like a, you know, a responsible or wise thing to do. It's probably something right. I, you know, I might not do now, but those are the risks I was willing to take back then. Right. Now that sounds amazing. I've always thought yeah. about, well, uh, we used to spend time on the Outer Banks in North Carolina and uh, occasionally I'd get to walk through houses that had been by hurricanes taken off their foundations and were, you know, and if no one was around and no one was looking, you could take the risk and go check out these houses that were, and to, to see a right angle space like that, you know, it was very kind of like, huh, this is, it's a powerful, awesome. it's a powerful effect, right? Yeah. The, that distortion, it makes you question like, which way's up? Am I seeing straight? What, what, you know, why is it my body thinks that this way is down and, but it's, you know, it's just, it's, um, yeah. it's, a fa it's fascinating. It kind of test of, test of perception. Yeah. yeah. There's a, there's a, I don't know if you'd call him a lifestyle <laughs> photographer or just a documentary photographer, uh, Daniel Pollan. Uh, that lives in Buxton, North Carolina. Um, that he he's a he's a really good photographer of the just the natural environment and life of that area. Hmm. But he's constantly getting into these houses that have been skewed. Or he has this amazing shot of like a a vacation home that's got a pool table and some artwork in the background that's very vacation home artwork. You know. <laughs> um, and there's a uh, sliding door to the left of frame and coming in through that sliding door is the ocean. It's like the oh. foam and like a wave is coming into that living room. And it looks like, wow, this must be a setup, just set kind of thing. But it's actually during a hurricane where one of these waves is, is coming into the living room. And it's, it's a really, really just an amazing shot that he has. Um, it sound, but, yeah. sounds powerful and, and surreal. It sounds yeah, like, very surreal. Yeah, it, yeah. it is very interesting. Um, so that 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 really describes uh, you were already kind of training as a glutton for punishment in doing such big scale things. But that's that's really insane and awesome that that someone had the audacity to do something like that, take the risk. And as you described, you're working with groups of people, so you're already kind of naturally developing a, a team and a leadership capability. Um, that, that's very interesting. I've had some thoughts about doing art on larger scale, uh, but nothing that, uh, that involved. Um, it would be more so uh, making scenes in the forest through kind of a, um, a manner of, if you were to spray just individual parts of trees, you could make a whole scene as long as the viewer was standing in one single spot. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, I think it would be an amazing thing to be walking through a forest and just see bits and pieces of something. But then as soon as you walk into this one spot, all of a sudden yeah. you could see a three dimensional thing all around you. Yeah. It would just be so much work. But yeah, getting a team like that and actually executing something like that now that I've said it and I'm going to put it out on the Internet, so maybe someone else will take it over. But it, it was my idea first and I really want to do it. But <laughs> how to do it, I don't know. Um, so. You, you went from artist. Uh, now, explain to me your take on the sustainability and how light and what was it? Light and uh, transparency. I forget what I read there, but essentially light and how people transfer through the building. How how's that really apply to uh, sustainability for you? Well, you know, I came, I came to be interested in um, sustainability, um, not not so much because I'm a you know, uh, a great like tree hugging lover of the environment, which which I kind of am. But um, um, but actually, just because I was as an artist, I was trying to study currents and culture. Like where where is society now? What what are we thinking about and valuing and seeing that we didn't used to see? And it occurred to me that this kind of interest in the ecology was you know was actually kind of fairly new in say the the sixties and growing in in our awareness that we talk about things you know that have to do with greens and sustainable and ecology that no one was like it was the furthest thing from people like your and my minds you know 50 100 years ago um they had other things on their minds important things on their minds um 
And then what happened was one day I actually just read the statistic that, you know, 38 to 40 percent of energy consumption um, is attributable to to buildings and construction and that that's actually more than the entire transportation sector combined. And, you know, I looked around the city where um, where I was um, living at the time. I was actually living in Hong Kong and I was thinking about all the millions of housing units, each one running their air conditioners and just how much energy that was actually using. And, you know, the more I read about it, the more I realized that, uh, um, that you know, as an architect um, and for anyone trying to make a building, you know, it's, it's a reality that we really should be aware of and facing up to. Um, and it's something we could have, we should do better than that. And, and you know, and, and, and so, we, you know, I'm trying to lead by example. And I think we are doing better than that. So I started to, you know, the first house I designed, um, I tried to use, um, you know, passive, passive solar strategies, meaning, you know, shade the sun when you don't want the heat in like the peak of summer and, you know, the middle of the afternoon or get the sun to shine in and that your main windows, you know, in the middle of winter to heat, to heat the house up and, you know, passive ventilation and, you know, high performance building. Well, I just started to study the kind of building science around it. And I realized um, that it doesn't take that much um, to have a really big positive impact. All it takes is some mindfulness and the right thinking and, you know, a little bit of orchestrating all these specialists and budgets and so on to kind of work in that direction. Um, but, you know, people, people when they, you know, including the clientele who are building these houses or whatever types of buildings they are, you know, they're appreciative of knowing, um, w you know, what they can do to, to make, an, make an environmentally responsible building. And so, you, you know, the flip side of this is, you know, my, my more purely artistic side has always, in philosophical side, has always, you know, when I think about architecture, I think of it not only as that which gives us shelter and, you know, the relationship of form and function and all the obvious stuff, but actually it's also what separates us from the world. Like it is in between me and nature. It's between me and the sky, it's between me and the birds, it's between me and the wind and the trees, and it is in between. And how, how we can make buildings that don't make us so connect, disconnected with nature, but have a more um, poetic, a more touching, a more inspiring, a more healthy, uplifting um, uh, effect on, on the people, you know, within the buildings. Uh, you know, I think it has a lot to do with, you know, in the ways in which a building can be designed to actually not just disconnect us from nature, but to connect us with nature. And natural light is a huge part of that. It connects you with the time of day, with the seasons, with just light and sky itself. Um, and so, you know, this is something that, you know, has been a, talked about in, in modernist architecture going back 100 years now. Um, and, you know, we've got great examples of glass buildings, glass houses, glass. And but I just want to point out that it's not just a matter of like more light. It's not that it's like the more light, the better or the brighter, the better. It, you know, there are qualities of light that have to do with kind of mood and atmosphere but then there are also you know like i was saying before times in which you know being lit brightly from one side or from above or from both sides or you know seeing a transition over the course of the day with how the light shifts within a building because of the passage of the sun and just being aware of the rhythm and cycles of nature even like at a very subconscious level but we all like we're all sensitive to, to natural light um uh you know, it just just has a it just has a huge impact on on what I was talking about before, which is your kind of mood and sense of self, and you know, you know, and quality quality of life. So, um, you know, it's something that pe that people um, um, are I find are caring about more and more, and and more open to and receptive of, especially like, you know, with pandemic lockdown situations or um, restrictions, a lot more people kind of working at home, spending more time at home, studying at home, you know, doing their, you know, workouts at home. Um, there's more, you know, there's more time indoors and it makes it even more um, uh, important and, and noticeable um, the degree to which buildings separate us or connect us with light and nature. Right. Yeah, there's, there's so much in there that I had so many questions that I'm trying to remember or points that I'm trying to make now, but that, that's a great uh, encapsulation of all the information. The thing that stands out to me, uh, for one, uh, I'll go over... Uh, my my house that my wife and I designed and built and how we oriented insulated solar and all that I'd like to get your take on some of the solar stuff too um, 
and then uh, the the attachment to the outside. So I we're we're located in Maine, and so we we wanted really high insul insul insulative values. I'm I'm saying that wrong. Insulation values, yeah. In really high insulation values. My wife is one of those people who's always cold. Now she gets to wear a t-shirt in January and, and loves it. But we have a wall that's um, probably, let's see, uh, sorry, someone's trying to constantly text me here and I thought I turned those things off, but we'll just live through the dings. Um, we, uh, we wanted a lot of glass because I'm, I'm very, very visual. And we were lucky enough to end up with a fairly large plot of land in the woods that we could clear a lot of it out, clear a lot of the smooth granite off as well and not have to see any other houses, just woods and some open space. It's really nice. Sounds so great. I wanted this ability to be able to, sorry, I'm really not enjoying these. Um, how do I get rid of that? Reply. I find if I just drop my phone in the toilet, it stops. Making well, it, my, um, my, my laptop is still picking up text and I thought I turned it off, but it's still coming. So focus. Um, so I wanted to be able to be in the living room, see the woods, but also feel connected to the very small patch of grass that we had in front of the windows that then is boundaried by these very smooth, um, these very smooth pieces of granite that were naturally there. And they're, they're really smooth rounded pieces. So it's really beautiful. Um, but we put the house, the floor, very close to the outside level. So you could sit in the living room and the windows go floor to ceiling. And so you have the feeling of like sitting in the yard, essentially. And when it snows, it's really beautiful to sit there by the wood stove and just look out right onto the snow. But they're like triple glazed windows so that you're not hardly, you know, losing any heat out of them, com you know, in comparison to stuff you'd normally have. Um, but we, we recently just added solar to that as well. So we've, we found that, you know, we, we were going to orient it pretty much south. And at the last minute, we changed where we were at on the site because of some limitations of granite that we would have just had to blast out. And so we moved the house. We still face slightly south with the main windows. And we have a concrete floor that absorbs warmth and it all the whole day after 12, which is great. And we found that the house pretty much heats itself, almost zero input, especially when we're using the wood stove right. and a very little uh, electrical input to heat it. Now that we have uh, the solar, we, my wife drastically oversized the solar to be able to power basically everything, which each solar company we got was kind of like, you sure you want that much? But she wanted that much, so we got it. And it does power both our hot water here, which is a a heat pump that's located in the attic so all the heat that we have in the house goes up to the attic and then the heat pump for heating the hot water actually pulls that heat again and heats up the water which is which is a nice benefit there how big how big a solar array is it i think it's like 36 panels it's it's yeah. huge for for a house i mean the people that know solar and all of that in our area have told us like wow you you genuinely don't need that much to eliminate your electrical bill my wife my wife wants to be able to go off grid if she wants and not have to have any connection to the grid and be able to run everything and we're pretty close to that as long as we pick and choose what we run i think she got a solar arc inverter i believe if i'm getting it wrong she's going to be a little upset <laughs> But um, it, it's a pretty neat feeling to know that we built a house right. We built something and designed something that, that works for us, that we spent 13 years essentially dreaming about and understanding how we live to then be able to design something along all those kind of areas that you touched on. And then to add the solar to it is, is kind of neat. You can just pull open your phone and look at like how much energy are we producing right now? How much are we consuming and how much is going back into the grid? All of that's a, a, a really really uh, enjoyable thing to actually settle into. It's, it's kind of weird. I never expected that, that I'd be into that kind of thing, but here I am. I guess it well, comes in your 40s. So, you, I mean, you find it kind of, you know, you know sat satisfying and, and yeah. uh, you really appreciate it. And, you know, it's, again, it's part of your life. This is a great story. This is. Yeah, yeah. but now I want to get an electric car because I could power it up for free. So. <laughs> That's good. But I, I need to not do that. I've had too many cars in my life. So, yeah. 
Um, walk me through now some of the uh, very atypical uh, projects that you've been involved with and, and kind of what you've learned from doing these kind of outside of the norm projects and the, the real takeaways that have been able to apply back to the more you know, standard projects that you've worked with. Well, you know, I've worked on all sorts of projects, um, houses and transit buildings and public monuments and uh, um, mass planning, larger, larger communities and multi-unit developments. Um, you know, we, uh, um, um, we, when we're talking about sort of, you know, light and and um, sustainability and the quality of the environment, one of one of the projects I like to think about is um, uh, the Vaughan subway station, a kind of mass transit station. We worked on the design of uh, um, uh, here in Ontario, just north of Toronto. We worked with a team of architects, including some great New York architects, Grimshaw architects. And one of the, one of the curious things um, that happened was um, there, the architect's original design had a big, beautiful dome roof. Um, and part of, you know, I was brought in to be, you know, to kind of develop, you know, develop the kind of artistic side of, of this building. And I was suggesting puncturing it with skylights strategically located with kind of um, reflective coffers to bounce light down into the station. So at certain times of day, certain bits of light would hit certain places and it would be a sort of choreographed dance of natural light with color because they were bouncing off colored reflectors down through the station it was supposed to it was supposed to bring in natural light just for like you know human health and 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 uh comfort and pleasure uh but then also the kind of artistic beauty of it it's dappling and how it changes over time interestingly the architects were told that they were not allowed to have any skylights in the station uh because the um agency that governs the maintenance um, wouldn't allow it. It's too much work to have to clean horizontal skylights. But when I stood up in front of a committee of a 60 of them or something like that, and I said, no, this is artistically important. This is essential to the artistic concept of what we're trying to do for people's, for the enriching this commuter experience. They actually took notes and overruled the decision. And I, I learned something from that, which is that there, like we were talking earlier about all the all the things that sort of conspire against doing really good design work, all of the budget pressures and and you know schedule pressures and liability pressures and all that stuff. When you actually explain the value of something to people in terms that they can understand, it's actually quite amazing how even even a stodgy large conservative old bureaucracy will actually embrace it and change. So. You know that was a that was a little bit of a turning point for me because I realized actually you know what we we can you know beat the odds at least some of the time you know and help make a positive impact. So you were you were kind of met with the bureaucratic, yeah. You know like nope sorry don't go there, and you yeah. said no let me make a plea to this and yes. in in the ability to communicate across openness to conscientiousness really yeah. you came with this experience and this idea of an experience that comes from someone who's artistic and open and say, I can envision this. It will be great. Here's my proposal to the people that run the bureaucracy that are naturally more conscientious and conservative. And they said, yeah. Paul, you've, you've convinced us uh, this is going to be a great thing. We will change our bureaucratic policy in this instance. You've made a good case. Let's do it. And to, to me, that's really interesting because of a lot of the stuff I've gone through. I've I've always experienced this pushback or resistance to to change to anything outside of the norm and anything else. And at some point in my life, I realized a resistance to change is as it should be. Because if every idea, every chaotic open idea that anyone had, if they could just throw it into the the gears, if you will we'd get something like, yeah, sorry, the last four years we've had. We, you have to make a good case uh, when you're wanting to change something uh, that's, that's outside of the norm. And it's as it should be that there should be conservative, conscientious people who are skeptical of the arts, but have an open enough of a mind to say, I might not be the artist, I might not be the open person, but I know there are people like that that bring value and I have to hear them and I have to act responsibly towards my commitment to the bureaucracy and the, the holding of the consistent things that keep us safe and keep us going, but also be open to the well-made case for expanding, growing and creativity. 
Yeah. And that understanding that I think is at the core of our, um, of, of our reality, honestly. I think it's, you know, it's Democrats and Republicans thinking that everyone should be this or everyone should be that when it's just not the case. They have to be, mm -hmm. they are born these things and they have to be those things and they have to know the value of each other to be able to, I mean, who's going to operate this station and who's going to maintain it? It's going to be people who have much more of a conscientious view to maintain something that someone's created that is beautiful. You know, yeah. at some point, someone said, yeah, it's going to be a completely circular temple and there's going to be a dome on top with one single light and it's going to be a shaft. And someone there was like, uh, no, sorry, Caesar, that's a terrible idea. We're not going to do that. No one can build that dome, you know. And eventually someone was like, no, no, we'll put empty clay pots in it. It'll be beautiful. It'll shine on the statues at certain times of the day and it'll be amazing. And finally, someone was like, all right, let's just try it. And, yeah. and I think we've come to a place in our society where we put so much emphasis on cost and reproducibility, and just like stamp them out, big, big box stores, uh, you know, just uh, engineered bridges rather than having an artist and an engineer creating things. We've come to a very, uh, a very, it's kind of like if you go into the northern part of Maine, you'll see a lot of houses and trailers that look like what you were saying earlier. They separate you from the outside environment. And that's their primary and, and seemingly sole purpose. It's like, get me out of the cold. That's all I need right now. Yeah. And until, until we kind of say, all right, we're sheltered, we're warm. Let's say, all right, we're here. Now, how can we move forward? Um, it, at our civic level and at our societal economic yeah, level, I think we've come to a point where hopefully we're starting to, to turn past that in, in North America. And Europe, for a long time, has had much more of a policy of, you know, an architect and an uh, engineer, an artist and an engineer involved on bridges in, in civic structures, you know. Uh, where in the U.S. it's kind of like, yeah, that bridge is all across the country. It's just some massive I-beams and some concrete and some rails, and they paint it kind of a bluish green, whatever, and we move on. But occasionally you'll come across a bridge that's ornate and has all this beautif beautification on it. And th that's really inspiring things that someone made the case like you did and actually found that they were able to break through and speak to the, you know, the bureaucrats and they were receptive to it. So how have you found that? being able, how have you found the ability to apply that in, in further projects? Um, well, you know, I mean, it, you, there are a couple of points you're making there. And one is about kind of the relationship of, of um, convention and invention. Not, not everything has to be like innovative, the new way of doing it. And I think you're right. There's actually conservatism and and being and like, why not just do it the way that the tried and true way is a very is a very valuable, reasonable force. And so, you know, with with my own projects, I'm I'm very mindful to um, um, to appreciate uh, um, a lot of conventions which uh, uh, which are tried and true and have evolved uh, for for very good reasons. The way we configure certain rooms, the way we you know build walls, you know the way the way we do things, and so. Um, one, one just has to be mindful that the moments where you're trying to invent, you're really mindful about when you're trying to invent and recognizing that invention is almost never something absolutely new. It's actually just a little tweaking of, or, or maybe sometimes a bringing together of two things in an unusual way. Um, so, you know, I think, I think um, convention in, innovate, and, and invention, you just need to, you know, to, to be mindful of the kind of dance and relationship um, with them. And then, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the pressure of cost and, and, you know, the kind of generic, just, you know, doing it the kind of fast known way, um, uh, you know, that's, that's, you know, that, that, as you've said, requires, um, you know, a whole culture to, to be behind it. You know, the reason certain European cultures, let's say like Danish culture of the last you know, has a very strong design culture, a very strong architectural culture, a government that's invested in a private sector that understands it. There's a sense of, you know, ownership for the long term and that the extra capital cost when you amortize it over, you know, the life of a building, hopefully that's a, a long life if it's a well-built building, is actually a drop in the bucket. And, you know, if we can just be mindful of long-term value 
And I think that's the argument that you have to make when you're talking about trying to make beautiful, inspiring bridges instead of, you know, utilitarian and, you know, not so beautiful bridges um, that are going to need more maintenance in the shorter term and actually cost more in the long run. Right. You know, that's that's kind of the argument you have to make. And there, you know, the same the same is true with houses. It, it goes on any scale. There, There's a very interesting thing that I don't know I can completely flush out, but um, the in mentioning the, the Danish uh, society, you know, country, whatever society, uh, the, the values that they have, um, allow them or they embrace this, uh, this more long view, uh, funding, taking social, social projects, civic projects, as far as built environment, uh, social, uh, relations and everything within the country, they have a different view than America that's more communal and more long-term, in my opinion, um, where America, uh, U.S. specifically, I think more so, that's where most of my experience is from. I won't throw Canada under the bus there, but I'll say America is far, far more singularly individualistic because um, you have to think if you're crazy enough to get on a boat and go to a different country as far as the people who had resources that were accepted and brought here or that came here on their own free will that that set up the tone of the nation rather than people that were stolen from a country and forced to come here the different subject obviously but like Australia there we've we have a selected group of people that, that is highly individualistic. And in, in contrasting the two, you look at our architecture compared to European architecture, especially civic stuff, and it, it is far less funded, far less creative. It, it's much more restrained and much more pragmatic, probably, than, than artistic and expressive. Um, but when you look at our healthcare, our, interestingly, I, have, I know, I'll, I'll just leave this person as a friend who worked with a lot of Danish doctors uh, over the last year. And you take the comparison with, within our architecture that we can understand as far as the disposition of the Danish culture towards architecture and the built environment compared to the American one. And then you uh, look at our approach to medical care of the American environment compared to the Danish one. The Danish one, is far more accepting of death and letting people go that might be uh, close to the edge already. Which, as, as an American, we see this as like just a deep wrong. And, and the friend that I have that worked in this situation probably saved, and just in the stories he's told me, like two or three people that walked out two days later alive and fine, were it left up to these Danish doctors they would have let him go, like completely wow. let him die. And it's not that they were, I don't think, it's not that they were lazy or anything else, but as a country and a disposition towards healthcare, there's less of an emphasis on the, the importance of the individual and more so on the importance of the community. And I think they balance uh, their approach as a, what's the term when you're tri- you know, when, when you're in war and there's a lot of people coming in and you have to determine who's going to get care and who isn't, uh, there's some medical term there, but they more so balance a, in the effect on the community and the cost on the community to try and save this individual rather than no matter the cost, no matter the debt or anything else, save the individual's life. And there, there is a difference there that you can see in both the built environment and the medical environment. And it's interesting how, how you see that play out. And I don't know if there's much more that I can really say or if you can, you can even weigh in on that at all, but it, it's an interesting take where you have these two outcomes of, of culture, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it. There's um, um, a collective sensibility um, and a sense of existing in a long historic time frame um, as a culture in, in, mo in most of the European cultures I've experienced. Um, that it is is not the same in in the United States or or in Canada or other sort of more new world countries. Um, it's more individualistic. There's no doubt about it. Um, and you know, frankly, that you know, I found that that has reflected in my own practice. We do a lot of you know private 
uh, work, residential work and so on for, for individuals and families because they're the ones who, um, who want to get behind it, who want to get these behind these ideas about artistry and sustainability and so on. And, you know, the story I told about it being for a, a uh, public transit station was, you know, a bit more of a, um, of a, of a rarity, which, you know, makes it a good story. Uh, but it's also kind of demonstrates that, um, what, what you're saying, what you're saying, which is less of a kind of, um, collective, a willingness to kind of invest in that sort of collective, um, way of being. But I, I'd also just say that, you know, when we're differentiating cultures, um, and mindsets between say European cultures and American cultures, um, you know, the things that I'm interested in that have to do with light and nature that you're interested in, which you describe with the beautiful, you know, granite rock outside your house and the wood burning stove. And that also comes from, uh, you know, another aspect of our kind of American disposition, which is, you know, a kind of confrontation with nature. You know, when you come to a land that, you know, this fresh green breast of a new world and it's, you know, it, it's not, you know, generations of, of plowing and house building that you're inheriting. You're you're up against like wolves and lions and tigers and bears. And uh, and and so we, we tend to like, you know, be mindful of our relationship to nature, like, you know, much more so than I think we even realize. Um, and certainly, you know, I'm no exception. My my interest in you know, buildings and houses connecting to nature and light and so on, um, you know, probably comes from that. Oh, that's interesting. That's a that's not really an aspect I've ever really considered that uh, we we are more frontier oriented in a way. And it connects yeah, I, I us think, to I, land a little I more. I think maybe. it's true. America was a frontier. And, you know, when you walk outside your door in in you know Milan or Barcelona or, or or Copenhagen, you're inevitably kind of confronting history. When when yeah. you and I walk out our front doors, you know we're we're confronting a, a little bit of history, but right, you know it's more about a landscape. Right. Yeah. yeah you walk out your door in Europe, and you're more so confronted with community. Where yeah. in America, you're going to be a little. The average is going to be that you're more so uh, confronted with landscape and survival a little yeah. more and and yeah. it's interesting if you look into the the holding on of religious belief systems and the things that encourage that where even um i believe canada has less of of a religious bent be, i think because of the more socialistic policies of education and healthcare being taken care of the the ideas that i've heard are that when you have more things weighing on you, when you're more likely to be in a foxhole, essentially of of debt from medical or uh, medical or uh, education and everything else, when you have those pressures on you, there's there's more of a tendency to uh, hope for an an outside disposition of power, if that's the right way of putting that, yeah, or yeah. some hope. And, and it, it tends towards more of a religious belief system rather than a society that's oriented around far more a uh, civic community rather than highly individualistic and making it on your own. That's a, an American and Canadian to a degree uh, sentiment, I think, that, that's I think a highly... So. I can do this on my own, but it's going to take me, myself and God and a truck and a dog. So <laughs> I think I just wrote a country song. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I, I have one last question here and then yeah. uh, anything else. Uh, beauty, artistry and sustainability all arise in tandem through a process that is as much about the circumstances of the building's users as it is about the landscape, nature and cultural in which the building is to be erected. Talk me through your philosophy on that as far as uh, the, the problems that people bring as well as the the problems not as much but more so the things that have to be accommodated in a site what's the what's the process or magic sauce that you've found to be able to to best marry those things together in a cohesive design well um i think what we do is we we talk um you know amongst ourselves here at, here at my studio and 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 to the clients and the people we work with uh about about um about how good design isn't something you uh, you you know draw up and frame. It's actually a, a form of evolution. It's an iterative process, and uh, 
Um, what, a, what a good architect does is take a whole bunch of inputs and variables about site and location and budget and function and blah, 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 and synthesizes a result. But that synthesis um, needs to come through a process which, um, uh, um, where, where, where you kind of put something out there and open it up to conversation and critique and then rework it and evolve it. And um, it's, a, it's an involved process. Like it's, it, it takes a little while. Um, our clients have to be willing to, um, uh, to give it a little more time and a bit more nurturing and watch something unfold. So just like I try to tell them with natural evolution, every you know, iteration and step is a little bit of an advancement forward. We do the same thing with our designs so that you know, by the time it's shovel ready and you know, you're starting to build foundations, um, you have something that has, has, has a life of its own and a kind of sophistication of its own and has had a lot of input and a lot of um, thought um, um, from a lot of people, a lot like the way a writer works with an editor and, you know, mm. goes through iterations and marks up scripts and moves, you know, moves chapters around and moves words around and changes the character's name and the fundamental metaphor, that kind of work that it takes yeah. to, to get a great novel, you know, is the kind of work that it takes to get a great building design, even a, even a modest building, even a small house. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I've learned a huge amount from specific selected specific clients uh what what are some of the best clients you've had and what have you learned from them um uh boy i am i've worked with a lot of wonderful people um the best ones that i've worked with um tend to be you know uh thoughtful and open-minded and and you know demanding you know they they want they want to get a lot out of it, and um, uh, they push it, and they push me, and uh, um, and it's wonderful. And what was the other part of your question? Remind me. Uh, who have been some of the best clients you worked with, and what is it that you've learned from them? Um, well, uh, um, you know, I work with a lot of um, private individuals, and I can't I can't actually name names, and you wouldn't necessarily sure. know them anyway. What have I learned from them? Um, you know, I, one of the surprising things about my my own career path and being an architect is I I didn't, you know, when people become a um, a teacher or a nurse or a massage therapist, they often talk about wanting to help people. A lot of people in different careers talk about wanting to help people. It's not that I didn't want to help people, but that's not what motivated me to be an architect. Like I talked about, it was my own obsession with landscapes and light and situations and, you know, environments and perception and stuff. Um, so this great surprise and what I've learned from people is that is that the most gratifying thing about being an architect is just how incredibly um, appreciative the, the owners and clients and users are at the end. Um, and to me, for whatever reason, that has surprised me at how deeply satisfying it is, uh, mm. even more so than, than the beauty of the building itself. Yeah, to, I mean, because I have the background, I was able to design my own home, but to see uh, the, the, the tailored fit and how it accommodates our life to, to, yeah. to have a home that was intentionally designed is like nothing you spend so much time there and, and very interesting side note for me like the first time i went into our front door it's our, we we kept our house extremely simple yeah. fairly small really simple roof plane we really wanted to invest on a few key elements that we knew yeah. would cost money but would be worth it and so we have really good insulation and a really huge window wall that connects us to the to the land yeah. um but to to walk into that space when like they first put in the windows and the the film comes off you know and it's it's just all open and it's just it's a it's an emotional like wow an incredibly beautiful space and but what's weird is every time you come in after that it's a little less and eventually you get used to it it's still beautiful and you you still appreciate it but it it's not like every time you come in the door is like oh my goodness and it, it's funny, we, we went with some Ikea cabinets to save cost, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but we got these white ones that, um, that are glossy, very flat, glossy surface. 
And I went up to get something out of the, and actually we just put these other cabinets up because we couldn't afford it at first. And we, so we just got them this last year to put uh, some wall cabinets in. But I went up to get something out of it. I think it was raisins, not that's important. But I, in the reflection of the cabinet, I saw the living room behind me, but it was reversed, right? And it was the first time I was seeing the living room reversed. And so the hill outside was going a different direction. The rocks looked different. The trees looked different. The windows and the space inside looked different. And I looked at it and I was just blown away. I was like, wow, look at this space. And I turn around and it's the space I've seen the whole time, but it's the right way around. Yeah. And there's no emotional thing at that point. But then I turn around and I look at the cabinet again and I can see it. And again, the emotions. It's a really weird thing to me to understand that there's this, this newness of experience that is encapsulated within a space that you become acclimated to, but if you can see it new, it, it, it affects you again. And there's yeah. philosophically and psychologically, there's something there that I think ties into what childhood is and why there's an impressionable age and that time of life when everything was more magical because you're experiencing almost everything for the first time and you're not living against preconceived ideas of what should be happening that makes that part of life magical. And to now understand that through this weird architectural situation where I saw a reflection and to understand from architecture to then translate it into kind of what my children are going through that every time I take them to a new place to see their eyes just, you know, open up or to, you know, show someone a photograph for the first time as I've seen it. And I've created so many times when they see it, they see it new for the first yeah. time. And there's this, yeah. wow. And I'm sure when, you know, the, that ability to go with clients and have them experience a new home for the first time and, and watch them emotionally receive what, what you've created is, is very, uh, very fulfilling. And, uh, something that that sits with you and and gives you um gives you the feeling of you know actually helping people and giving them something that will go with them through time that will house yeah. all those memories and experiences and times in life and that's something really important and I, and like yourself i i did not have the interest in being a nurse or massage therapist or any of that that's more person to person because i'm not a i'm not unless it's like a one-on-one -on -one conversation I'm not a person to person like, all right, let's talk about generalities. You'll notice my first question was like, what's the underlying, you know, fabric of reality, Paul? And I say, Woo. but that's, you know, what it is. So <laughs> anyways, I think I'm, I'm going in circles now, but um, any, anything else that, that you had hoped that, that we'd talk about that we didn't touch on or? No, I, I love you're talking about, you know, the childhood experience and that kind of ever new appreciation and you're seeing a reflection and renewing your appreciation in a way, you know, as an architect, I'm always trying to you, you appreciate the world and, and, and every work is trying to kind of renew, is the kind of ongoing growth and renewal uh, of the world, just like plants in, in spring. Um, but also your, your own house is a, is a beautiful example of how, um, of how powerful, uh, you know, a few simple things, well thought through, what a powerful effect that that can have on on you, on your on your quality of life. I think it used to be these things about oh, I've got a great view and I've got such great light and this countertop so beautiful and all that stuff. That used to be considered just like luxury. That was just like some luxury, which is a translation for like waste of money. Um, actually, it's it's my life. It's your life, right? This is real. This is the life we live. If if it's not it's not luxury, it's quality of life, and it's I think people are are um, tuning into it more than ever, and uh, certainly in the design of buildings and houses, it's it's a it's a great time because of that to be an architect. Well, it's it's as the sophistication of a society or a system or of information increases as it becomes more complex. I I think everything surrounding all of that becomes that much more accurate and uh, complex as well. So if you were the previous example of, you know, a, a double wide trailer in the North Woods of Maine, there's not as much complexity there or complexity because someone has chosen to, to live their life de not detached and not that it's wrong, but for them, they wanted to be in a place that was away from a lot of people 
and cost very little to to actually keep maintaining. And I I am I'm a result of that as well. I've I've chosen to live in Maine, where you know it's cold, but there's less people. It's a little more affordable. There's less business opportunity, but it's also more of an open slate. Especially the town where I moved to, Biddeford, it had a lot of potential at the time when I moved to it, and it's showing a lot of that potential now. But I think as the complexity of society, of individuals and everything increases, all the things around them uh, in, in a same manner become more complex. The buildings become more uh, complex and intricate. You know, housing, civic uh, belief structures, interestingly to me, become less ornate and, and more refined into the core principles. So if, if you look at more modern examples of religious practice they're far more focused in these singular things of like love and empathy and forgiveness rather than all these traditions and complexities of um, seemingly detached moral structures or behavioral structures or eating things it's like all these technicalities kind of with the religious practice seem to go away a bit and and start to refine the refinement process gets down to the the very unique thing of it which interesting side note as well um a guy that i interacted with that worked at a really uh really high-end furniture company he was a craftsman employed there and the the stuff that he was making for the company it's it's extremely you know fairly minimal uh crafted you know you really emphasize the joints in the furniture and everything else but you see the joint you see how it works Everything's minimal and smooth and, you know, um, and this is a very highly developed and refined modern aesthetic to uh, furniture. But for him, what he liked to do when he wasn't at work is he would make these really ornate chairs that were not about the joints, but they were about the carvings of like lions and elephants or whatever carved into them. It was more ornate, but the, the interconnectedness of it was not the thing. It was... It was the ornate nature around it. And so you can see that through history. Uh, you know, the, the, you go through Rome and you see some of the first, I think, Baroque temples. They become so much more about these, uh, cap, not capitals, but the free, freezes. I, I, I'm lacking the correct term, but they, instead of being stone straight pieces, they become these curved things. And they, it went far more into this ornate, expressive of, of, expression of luxury and we can do it because we just can but as you get into the really modern you get into this you know the like you know a scandinavian aesthetic of minimalism but the connection and the connectivity becomes the you know what's holding it together philosophically i think it it's that people get to a point of not having to worry about being eaten by an animal or having you know to find food all of a sudden they're they're able to uh turn their focus on more so the inner workings and the meanings of things at a time of peace, if you mm. will. You mm. can turn around and look at your belief system when you're not being shelled or shot at. So mm. it, I'm again going way off subject, but <laughs> I'm with you. Fun stuff um, when you get into it. So, anywho, uh, I really appreciate your your time and your and your willingness and interest in coming on and talking about your business and how you've very interestingly gone from this very, to me, very unique uh, process of artistic creation. It was very architectural that came around to actually now being practicing as an architect is, is, uh, is very interesting. And uh, I'm going to be going back and looking through your website and everything again. And do you have examples of the artwork that you had done in the past on your immediate website? Or? Uh, to be honest, I'd have to check. I don't know. <laughs> Well, uh, what is your what is your website and where people can find more information on your practice? It's paulraffstudio.com. The raff mm -hmm. is in is like riff raff, and there's riff -raff. no s on the end of studio. It's not like Warner Brothers Studios or something like that. Ah. Yeah, Paul Raff cool. Studio. So it's my name, but we're we're a, a a team of you know cosmopolitan, interesting people all uh, working together for a good cause. Interested in a lot of the ideas that you've been talking about, and it's just been a absolute pleasure cool well thank you so much paul and uh, are you guys on instagram or social media or anywhere we are. as well we are instagram and where where will people find you uh instagram i think it's paul raff studio as well paul studio. 
All right, great. Well, uh, everyone watching, go check out Paul's work, send him questions and compliments and all that, or criticism too. It's an architectural uh, culture. We, we embrace criticism uh, in, in a positive manner. But anyways, Paul, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing your thoughts and feelings and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, take, take care. care. Bye for now.